سلام علیکم و رحمت بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم All praises are Allah's Lord of the worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon our master the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his people This is now the, the third session of the talks and in the first session we spoke about the fact that the verses of the Holy Qur'an and the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, there are degrees and differing depths to them. And yes, there's something that we take at face value, there's a superficial or prima facie meaning we get, but that doesn't mean that all of Islam is confined to that prima facie meaning. It's multidimensional, it's multi-layered. As a result of this statement, then we, in the last session, last night, we wanted to highlight that this concept of qurb faraid and what it means to be an instrument of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that Allah speaks, hears, sees through an entity, an individual. And we discussed that in quite some depth last night. Just to acknowledge and be more appreciative at least in relation to those individuals who have acquired this proximity. Then today inshallah we'll just finish one or two areas which we weren't able to finish last night. And slowly we'll enter the main discussions from tomorrow, I think. In the first session, we spoke about the tradition that mentions 124,000 prophets. And this has an external meaning. And external meaning, meaning that from Prophet Adam alayhi salam, to the Holy Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. There were 124,000 prophets, and we spoke what that meant in some detail. But then we said even these kind of traditions have esoteric dimensions to them. just in case for those who weren't here last night, uh, esoteric dimensions only the Ma'asun can give. Only the infallible can say what the esoteric dimensions are. The non-infallibles, uh, they can try, they can explore, they can try and extrapolate with the help of other traditions. But they have to add the stipulation that maybe this is the esoteric dimension. They can't say definitively. But that doesn't mean we have to bar one's route to acquiring es esoteric dimensions and the depths of Islam. But we just have to say maybe, maybe this is the reason, maybe that's, this is one of the wisdoms behind it and so on and so forth. In relation to the esoteric dimension of there being 124,000 prophets, here, I wouldn't have mentioned or shared this with you if it wasn't from a very authoritative scholar. It was Mullah Hadi Sabzawari from around 150 years ago. He's written some of the best books in philosophy, especially Sadra's, Mullah Sadra's philosophy, and his books are still being taught in the houses. In relation to the esoteric meaning of 124,000. <coughs> he says, see, there's a one, two, four, zero, zero, zero. For a minute you have to imagine the Arabic numbers. 
one, two, four, zero, zero, zero. You see, it starts with one. Then double one, you get two. Then you double two, you get four, and continue, dot, dot, dot. Because there's zero in Arabic, it's like a small dot. One, double it, two, double it, four, just keep on going, dot, dot, dot. 724,000. Meaning, there's no end to the number of prophets. Now, yes, externally, the prima facie meaning, there's 124,000 prophets. The first with Prophet Ordan, and the last with our Holy Messenger. But now this is esoterically now. This is now looking at an other aspect. Thing to do with the prima facie, superficial understanding. It's a hidden aspect here. There's no end to the number of prophets. That dot, dot, dot signifying there's no end. Just keep on going. If you keep on doubling, there's no end. Now, how can that be? Because we know that our Holy Messenger was the last of the prophets, according to <laughs> explicit verses of the Holy Quran. And so we can't deny that. So what this idea of there being an infinite number of prophets, which you're trying to esoterically extrapolate from this tradition, where did you get this from? Can it be justified in any way? And here, I just, one has to just briefly mention one or two concepts we have in Islam, namely, the concept of cycles and the concept of the Dahul Ard, the scattering of the earth, in order to understand this 124,000. So, these cycles that we have in Islam, they follow successively one after the other. The cycle that we're in is called the cycle of Adam. He was the first in our cycle. But there's going to be a physical resurrection one day. Everyone's going to pass away. Now the next question is, will there be a new cycle after us? Or was there, were there cycles before us, before then Adam coming as the initiator to this cycle. Here I have to want to go through a few traditions in relation to this concept. We'll take it slowly. One from Imam Baghir alayhi salam who said Muhammad in قبل آدم الذي هو أبونا This past, before Adam, who was our father, ألف ألف آدم أو أكثر A thousand thousand Adams or more, meaning a million or more Adams, before Adam, our father. Now, this million doesn't mean there has to be one million precisely. And then with the stipulation or close or akthar or more, it means infinitely. It's innumerous or innumerable. In another tradition, someone asked the holy Imam, Hal kana qabla adama adamu was there an Adam? before our Adam? And the Imam said yes. Now, some of the Rovard, those who ask and narrate on behalf of the Imams, some of them, you see, suffice with the minimum. They weren't really after knowledge too much. They would ask a question, they get an answer, that's it. Some of them 
they would get to the depths of the meaning of the Imam, and that's why they weren't asked too many. But in between, there are people that have done a great service to me and you, who would keep on asking the Imam until they get to, you know, a firm answer to the very end of the matter. If it wasn't for these kind of people, we would have been much more limited in our access to many truths. So was there an Adam before Adam? The Imam said yes. He continued though, the questioner, and said, وَهَلْ كَانَ قَبْلَهُ آدَمُ And was there an Adam before that one? And the Imam said yes, and he continued, and was there one before that one? Then the Imam came with a principle. And the principle was, he said, كُلَّمَا سُئِلْ سُئِلْتُ فِي ذَلِكَ However, number of times I be asked, in this regard, فَالْجَوَابُ The answer will be, أَنَّهُ كَانَ قَبْلَهُ آدَمْ However, number of times you will say, and before that was an Adam. I always say, and before that there was an Adam too. You keep on asking, I'll keep on saying there was another before that too. There was another. Because there's no beginning. There's, there's no first Adam. We don't have such a thing. There's no first created person. There's no first created thing. Creation was from pre-eternity to post-eternity because Allah was from pre-eternity to post-eternity. Allah can never be manifestation-less. This idea that there's Allah and nothing and then from nothingness Allah creates the sun and the moon it's a position that many theologians hold. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just sharing a different perspective of what the Urafa have. But the Urafa don't like this perspective. That there's Allah and nothing else. And then it's from that nothing else, that nothingness, that Allah, that is, creates out of nothingness the sun, the moon, and so on and so forth. They have a problem with this. The first problem is that they don't believe in nothingness. Because nothingness is nothing. It, it's non-existent. To say something creates something from nothingness, they don't accept it. They say it's impossible. Why? They say go back to your fitra. Something rational. You think about it. Is there anything? Is there anything? That is nothingness. No, nothingness is nothingness. It doesn't exist. That's the first problem they have with it. The second problem is in their Tawheed. If you believe in this, your Tawheed is different. Your understanding of Tawheed may suffer. This is what they would have for claim. Who's right? I'm not saying who's right or wrong. But I'm saying what the, the Urafa are saying here. When there's Allah and nothingness, as you say, let's assume there is nothingness now. And then from nothingness, the sun and the moon are created. They're separate to Allah. Wow. And that's going to be problematic to heed wise, because nothing can be separate from Allah. There's Allah and nothingness, and now the sun, the moon, or whatever appears. The third problem is that, wait a minute, if you say there's Allah and nothingness, and then over a period of time, however you want to, although time may have no meaning here, things come to be, someone can pose a legitimate question. I'm looking for that entity when one is looking for the absolute perfection, Allah. 
You all see that there's a lot of nothingness, and then over a period of time, you create the sun, moon, and everything. I'm looking for that entity which never had any period of time that that entity itself was manifestationless. Because in your understanding of Tawheed, Allah was manifestationless once upon a time. And then things came to be. That's a deficiency, at least rationality-wise. You've limited his power. Whereas we say, Kulla yawmen hu fi sha'an. Every day, but day here meaning manifestation, moment to moment, manifestation to manifestation, it's who, it's Allah. Fi sha'an, in dimension, never was Allah manifestation less. It's impossible. Otherwise, then someone can pose a legit, legitimate question. It's like the chicken and egg, too, which was first, doesn't have to be a first. Keep on going back. Keep on going. Chicken, egg, chicken, egg. Keep on going back. Why, why do you want to insist there has to be one of them? Because from pre eternity to post eternity, this created thing wasn't from pre-eternity to post-eternity, but creation was. Manifestations were. But yes, this person, this prophet, this individual, no, they, they know. Only Allah was. So here it's important because the Samadhi understanding of Tawheed, that Hawal Awalu Wal Akhiru Wal Dahiru Wal Batin. Nothing can be Allah less. The first, the last, the outer, the inner. It's all Him in dimension. But with the numerical form of Tawheed, yes, there's Allah. Nothing else, and then second, something else comes, third, fourth, fifth, they arise. But with the first form of Tawheed, there's nothing but Him, but in dimension. Whereas with the numerical Tawheed, there's Allah, but then things arise afterwards, and they don't arise from Allah either. They arise from nothingness. You see, these problems arise. <laughs> Imagine you go to a clothes shop. All, everything there, clothes. And someone goes and sees a shirt. Someone sees a pair of trousers. Someone sees, for example, a pair of gloves. But someone sees nothing but thread, you see. There's nothing but thread there. All the manifestations we see, we see there, it's all thread. But that thread is in dimension. It's in these different shapes, molds. La ilaha illallah. Kulla yawmin huwa hu fi You can't separate anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all him, but in play, at work, in dimension. Whatever is, is a manifestation of Allah's attributes. Nothing can be Allah less. What the theologians call Allah, the philosophers call wujud, existence. The Warafa call it who. It's all one reality. Nothing can be existence less. Nothing can be Allah-less. Nothing is independent from Allah, from existence. But if your understanding is we have a sun, we have a moon, we have mountains, and then <coughs> Allah also controlling all this. No, oh, that's numerical Tawheed now. Which is okay, it's acceptable. Everyone, the understanding of Tawheed is infinite. You can't criticize anyone over their Tawheed. 
The only red line is you consider two and loss. That's it. So, there were infinite number of atoms before. There's no beginning. And then, in another incredible tradition, people were continuously inquiring about the ancestors of the Holy Prophet, before the Holy Prophet, in the presence of the Holy Prophet. So, who's your father? He would say, my father. For example, is Abdullah, he said, who's his father? One by one, they kept on going back. And who's his father? Who's his father? They kept on going. And then when they reached Adnan, who, you know, only a few generations after that, they would have reached Adam. The Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prohibited them from asking further. So don't ask anymore. Now, Sayyid Mustafa Khomeini, the son of the late Imam Khomeini, um, he passed away before the revolution. Maybe he was martyred, we don't know. But he was an incredible scholar. And uh, not only was he an indisputable mujtahid at that time, but in many areas he had it hard. He has a book in Tafsir. It's a very unique book. It's five volumes. But since he was martyred, then it wasn't able to be completed. He only reached chapter, verse 40 in chapter 2. But with those 47 verses that he gave at Tafsir, he wrote five volumes. It's in Arabic. Each volume being 1,000 pages. In this book, which was written a long time ago, you know, over 40 years ago, questions such as evolution, and many sensitive questions that arise today, he's answered in a lot of detail for over 40 years ago. Incredibly, yes. The taste that he had in tafsir was incredible also. That with every verse, he would say that the theologians would give a commentary in this way, the orafa in this way, the men of literature in this way, the philosophers in this way. It was unique. And um, he brings this tradition which I've just mentioned, that the Holy Prophet stopping them after his ancestor Adinan. He also brought the tradition before it that there's always one before, there's no end. Then he comes and says this. He says, That maybe it's alluding these two traditions that we mentioned, especially the last one the Holy Prophet prohibiting them after Adnan. Maybe it's referring to this fact. You see, again, la'allahu. Because why? Because when we go into the esoteric dimensions, they always say maybe. They don't speak definitively. If you look at many of Imam's books, 40 hadith, there's always a maybe, maybe this, maybe that. It's with maybe it's referring to this, that, and nahu la yantahi ila haddin wa ila shaksin, that these chains of the ancestors, one after the other, when the Prophet, Holy Prophet was going through them, it doesn't end at a certain point, or it doesn't end at a certain, with a certain individual who, la wara'ahu shaksin akhar, beyond whom. There's no other successor. There's no other person. It doesn't end anywhere. It keeps on going. So, with what we've said so far, that there would be 
there have been an infinite number of Adams before. There's never an end to Allah's manifestations. Inni jailun fil ardi khalifa. Inni, I. Verily I. What comes now is an attribute of one of us. An attribute which is intrinsic to this I of Allah. A signer. I assign. When Allah is called an assigner, especially when it follows up from in me, I, verily I, this is one of those essential attributes of Allah. Allah always assigns. He is never assigning less. That's why there were always Adams. There will always be Adams. There's no end. He is Jo'elon Fir'ad. There'll always be Adams. There'll always be Khalifas on earth. The question now is this. We said that the esoteric dimension of that tradition was that prophets are infinite. There's no end to the number of prophets. Now we know that in this cycle, prophets came to an end with our holy messenger. So now how do we make these two sets of traditions compatible? Here we have to speak about the cycles. And to speak about the cycles, we have to first speak about the whole Ard. On the 25th, of the Hijjah, of the Qa'dah, sorry, the 11th month of the, lunar, the Islamic lunar calendar, on the 25th day, it's, there's a mustahab fast assigned on that day. Dahwal Arad means the scattering of the earth, the spreading out of the earth. Have you ever asked yourself what's significant about this day? What's it all about? In the Quran, there is mention of the whole Arad. One in chapter 79, verse 30. Wal arda ba da ha ha. And the earth after this, 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 the demonstrative pronouns referring to the creation of the heaven before. Da ha ha, the earth. We spread it. We spread out the earth. <coughs> and in chapter 91, verse 6, Wal Arade, this is one of the oaths that Allah swears by, by the earth, Wa ma and he who spread it out. See, this spreading, scattering of the earth, it's all referring to this Dahul Arad. So, what happened in Dahul Arad? What did it mean for the earth to have spread out? Was it a small bit and then it kept on getting bigger? No. Here, the traditions go into more depth. The Quran gives the starter. The <coughs> traditions, being the esoteric interpretations of the Quran, goes into much more depth here. It speaks of the earth being covered in water. Now, whenever you see the word earth, Ard, in the Holy Quran, it's referring to not the planet, it's referring to the surface area of the planet. That is called earth. That is what Ard means in Arabic. It's the prima facie meaning of it anyway. The earth was covered in water everywhere. I just want to give the significance of the 25th of the Maqa'ade, while we're fasting every day, um, that every, um, every year that day. The earth was covered in water. And then the water died down, slowly by slowly. The first dry surface area of earth 
which appeared when the water was coming down was Mecca, where the Kaaba is now. And there was no building at that time. The sanctity of the Kaaba isn't attributed to the building at first, although the building is sacred, but it's that space which is sacred primarily. Why is that space sacred? And from that space, the earth from which Adam was created was used. Just because this dying down of the water, that was the first surface area that appeared dry. And then slowly other places, the surface area, it grew and scattered and spread out. That's the meaning of that will add the spreading out of the surface area until about 20% of the surface area of the earth was now dry. The rest was still covered in water. Ibn Sina, in his Isharat, he speaks of a concept called the successive and multiple resurrections. Iyama successive Qiyamat. See, Qiyama, we have to look at in two ways. There's a physical Qiyama with the physical signs that will happen at the end of time for a certain people. And there's a spiritual resurrection Qiyama which will also happen. That which is important, more important for me and you, is the spiritual Qiyamah. After death, it starts. It starts with Barzakh and it keeps on going. That's spiritual Qiyamah. And there's an end to the physical body. We no longer will have the physical body anymore, according to the Orafa. The theologians do believe that the physical body will be resurrected. Since I'm only sharing what the Orafa is saying for this particular talk. From death onwards, it's only us and our actions. However, we acted in this world, it will all be embodied from Barzakh onwards. In all those metaphysical realms of existence, from Barzakh onwards, there's no physical body anymore. There are bodies, but they're not physical. We'll speak more about that during the next few nights. I don't want to get drifted on this point right now. It's not the primary point I want to cover. But that's, that's the important realm that we have to really be worried about. The physical realm is the physical signs that will happen. Ibn Sina is saying that those physical signs of physical Qiyamat, which signify the end of time for a given cycle of people, is when water covers the earth again. So those signs, when the seeds all merge, it's when that's happening. When the sun is cleft asunder, it's when the water is covering everything. And then everyone will die. At least all human beings will die. Although here Oytullah Hassan has given a few interesting points. He says, yeah, it's an end to human life, but it doesn't mean it's an end to marine life. And that's a very delicate point that because with these physical resurrections, marine life, there's a continuity, it seems. Whereas with human life, it, there is no continuity. Although, say, Mustafa also believes with human life there's going to be a continuity, but that's another debate for now. So, the earth is covered in water. It dies down. Adam is created. We are created. And at the end, the water will surround the earth again. And that is physical Qiyama until the next cycle that an Adam will be created, that people will be created, there will be prophets, imams, whatever, 
books, people, and covered in water, it goes down again, and then a new cycle of people. This keeps on going, successively or not. There's no end. Allah is never without a Khalifa. Allah is never without crea- creation, which also includes humans, imams, prophets, and so on and so forth. Because in Nija Elon Fil Al, in Nija Elon, the essential attribute of Allah's, from pre eternity to post eternity, there will always be people, imams, prophets, the cycles one after the other. And that's why the esoteric dimension of that tradition is referring to this, that the number of prophets, there is no end. There is no end. What shall I say? Just keep on going. Don't, don't, don't. One, two, four. Just keep on going. Okay. Now, then all these prophets came with a message. But let's now focus on the prophets of our cycle now, which ended with our holy messenger. They came with a message. All the prophets that came, came with a serate mustareem, came with a straight path for us. All religions, all religions that, you know, are not distorted, the original religion itself. From Adam to our holy messenger, alayhi wassalam, they were all Salat al This Salat al I'm mentioning is the legislative type of Salat al It's another type we'll come to maybe later. It's a bit more complicated, that one. All religions have that Salat al-Mustaqim, assuming they're not distorted in any way. But we say, Ihdena as-Sirat al-Mustaqim, as-Sirat, the straight path. Appreciating that there may be many Sirat al-Mustaqim that has preceded Islam, but Islam came with the ultimate straight path. And there's nothing wrong with that, because the essence of religion is one. So why do we say there are differing Sirat al-Mustarims? One is higher than the other. We have to go to the prophet of that religion. <coughs> the differences of religions, the differences of the Sharias, are a result of the differences of the prophets. <coughs> And the differences of amongst the prophets are a result of the differences of the mirages those prophets had. In miraj they ascend to metaphysical realms and they acquire and become a recipient to divine knowledge. Then I'm coming back to the people they give that message to the people. All prophets were recipients to that divine knowledge. They were all saying, La ilaha illallah. But the degree of the ascensions differed. The higher the ascension, that metaphysical ascension, the more complete and perfect that essence of religion, the more complete and perfect, it will manifest. That's it. It's all one. It's one religion, one truth, one reality, one essence. How much of that one essence can be manifested depends on the prophet. How much of that essence can that prophet manifest depends on that prophet and how much he did a mirage. The members of the Ummah, of each Prophet, their potential is on a par with, the potential they can acquire, is on a par with the 
on a par with what that Prophet acquired in that Mi'raj. It's on a par with the book of that Prophet, that book which was a product of the Mi'raj of the Prophet. Previous Prophets, they came, they had a certain degree of Mi'raj, they came with a book. That book is what the members of that Prophet, where they can reach spirituality-wise. Then succeeding Prophets came with a new book, more perfected, complete. It's the same. It's just more, it's just more manifesting. It's more complete. The essence doesn't change. And now the members of the new Ummah with this Prophet can now reach a level of Tawheed that the previous Ummahs couldn't reach. The potential is there. Now why do we say our Holy Messenger is the last Prophet? It's because the Mi'raj he underwent was infinite, that no succeeding that it's impossible for there to be a succeeding Mi'raj. Because his recipient, degree of recipients in his Mi'raj was infinite in relation to Tawheed. You can't get higher. And then that was all reflected in the Quran. And that is our potential as members of the Muhammadan Ummah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's a, it's a great potential here that we have. We can't underestimate this. Okay, we're coming towards the end. I just want to finish somewhere. The, now, after since Adam and the Islam, which was around, let's say. 7 to 12, but maybe more accurately, 10 to 12,000 years ago. With these 124,000 prophets, with all this, one day the Holy Prophet was informed that revelation has now come to an end. And then, on hearing this, on being informed, he said to his people, the Holy Prophet said to his people, Lam tabqa ba'di min al after me, this prophethood, of it, nothing will remain except Mubashirat. Faqalu, they said, وَمَنْ Mubashirat, Ya Rasulullah. O Messenger of Allah, what is this Mubashirat that will remain after prophethood? You'll say nothing will remain but this. Allah, he replied, Righteous dreams. Yarohal mu'min, that the mu'min sees, the believer sees. There may be no prophet, there may be no imam, although. The physical imam is with us, but he's in occultation. But there's no excuse. First of all, we have the Qur'an. We have traditions. But there's another thing we have. There's another access point we have. Mubashirat. Dreams. Mubashirat, in the extended term, it means the visions. But usually people see visions in their dreams. But you can see visions whilst awake too. You can see Mubashirat whilst awake. You can see those Ru'ya, those visions whilst awake. But we usually sit when we're asleep. We'll speak more about this later. These visions are important. Seeing the face of Ali and his salam and your is Ibada. Now, many people, many hypocrites saw the face of Amir al Was that Ibada? 
what face of Agnero Morgan is this? When 40 people at the same time saw Amir al-Mu'minin, was it a physical Amir al-Mu'minin they saw? That's two. And then when it comes to seeing the 12th Imam, is it the physical seeing of the 12th Imam more important, or is it another kind of seeing which is open to us right now, which is more important to see, rather than just focusing on seeing the physical imam, with the physical reappearance, it may be in a million years' time. See, this has to be appreciated. But Allah, the means of communication with Allah, these dreams and these visions in general, these are important. Now, I'll speak more about this over time. If we don't have these visions, if we don't begin to see a form of seeing that animals don't have, then we are called deaf, and then we qualify as blind people. Man mata wa lam ya'rif Imam Azamani Someone who dies doesn't acquire Erfan in relation to the Imam of the time. They die a death of someone who died in the era of ignorance. Is that Erfan just what his father's name was, what his mother's name was? Is that it? Or is it referring to something more important here? We have to make sure we don't die as deaf, dumb, or blind spiritually. Otherwise, we die just like animals. It's the reason why these visions are there. These visions continue even after prophethood. Now, I'm hoping to speak about spiritual wayfaring and the different stages. Yes, sorry about that. And the different stages. And I, I will do, I think, from one, two or three sessions from now. But the I has to travel. And for this I that has to travel, we have to first understand what we mean by the I. Tomorrow I'll speak about this element. And it is a bit, I mean, it may be a bit over medical, but there's some interesting examples which can guide us as to what the I is. Then after that, we go through the different stages of spiritual wayfaring. And some of these concepts which have been, haven't, haven't completed explaining throughout the lectures, inshallah, I'll finish them. Allah <laughs> Thank you.